But here, it's been happening for a long time. One thread seems to be being controlled by the Western media, and it's generally fear-based. We're going to get you, we're going to kill you, we're going to stick things in you, etc., etc. Either they say the aliens are going to harm us, or they give us the impression that things are going to be bad if we know about them. The human abductions and animal mutilations I haven't touched on, but very uh, troubling to investigate, the evidence is all there, may also be components of a negative disclosure program. That's what it seems looks like to me. But another thread seems to be the events in Mexico and South America, with large-scale sightings and quite a bit of video footage, which is not generally not covered in this country at all. This seems to be what I think is part of a positive disclosure program. Where these things are coming along saying, we're here, you can't ignore us. We're not going to do anything, we're just telling you we're here. We're just showing you we're here. That's what that appears to be, is from what we're looking at. And what were those spheres doing? They weren't doing anything, they were just... There's so many of them, you couldn't say, well, this isn't a cat, this is a cat. You know, we've got two films of it, I haven't seen. One from one side and one from the other. I've never known of that before. Are they, uh, <coughs> could they be related to the food fighters? They by could be. Allied air crew. Could be the same group of ETs doing it. I don't know, it's just, you know, you're, you, that's a very good suggestion. I, I, I don't know, but yeah, it's a good suggestion. Now, um, I think the people who are running planet Earth, because there are people running planet Earth, and we don't know for them. We don't like them. Those that did 9-11 are behind the negative disclosure threat. I think outside agencies, such as uh, those that Wilbur Smith was in communication with, are behind the positive disclosure threat. Each person has a choice of which threat to pay more attention to, but we shouldn't be blind to the other thread. There's a positive and negative process going on here. Now, I contend that the negative disclosure program is um, large, and it formed, 9-11 formed part of it in terms of longer term planning. And I've, I've shown you this clip before, but I'm going to show you this bit again. Good morning, my name is Carol Rosen. In 1974, after being a sixth grade school teacher, I was introduced to the late Dr. Werner von Braun in the U.S., the father of rocketry. In my first meeting with him during that first three and a half hours, he said to me, Carol, you will stop the weaponization of space. And I said, uh, you know, teachers don't stop until June. He said, no, you have to understand this is February, and we have to prevent the weaponization of space because... I have been actively engaged in the investigation of a group of phenomena known as flying saucers for over seven years. During this period, I have read most of the available literature on the subject, interviewed a great many people who have seen unusual things in the sky, examined many pictures and physical objects, made observations with scientific instruments, and carried on a series of communications with intelligences claiming to be extraterrestrial. I started the investigation out of curiosity and as an extreme skeptic, fully expecting to find the phenomena to be due to man-made or natural causes. I am 48 years old, holding a master's degree in electrical engineering, occupy a responsible position in the Canadian government, hold a half dozen patents, author of several technical papers, and in general enjoy a background in technical work in science, indicating at least an average competence to study and report on phenomena of scientific nature. I have tried so far as possible to use conventional and standard methods and equipment and to investigate all possible angles before drawing any conclusions. In other words, I have followed the same general procedures which I would have followed if I had undertaken to study some more prosaic subject such as radio wave propagation. The first phase of the work consisted of reading all available literature collecting as much observational data as possible, and in general, getting a fair perspective of the problem. The second phase involved theoretical and laboratory work to find openings in our technology and to establish relevant reference points. And the third phase involved following up the many and varied leads which developed from the first two phases. I do not intend to dwell on the first phase of this work, 
as my experience was quite parallel with that of other investigators who have provided extensive published reports of their findings. Nor will I dwell on the many dead ends which were explored, which looked promising at first, but faded out under careful investigation. Nor will I be able to be as specific as I would like to be with respect to material given to me in confidence or which came to me through classified channels. Furthermore, it is not my intention to try and convert anyone to my way of thinking, but merely to state what I believe and why I believe it. Let us look at a few facts. First, hundreds of normal, honest people have seen lights in the sky which behaved like no light normally seen in the sky ought to behave. Second, hundreds of normal, honest people have seen what appear to be solid, real objects in the sky, which behave like no object normally seen in the sky ought to behave. Third, hundreds of people have seen objects in the Earth's atmosphere at sufficiently close range to see enough detail to enable them to say definitely what the object was not, even though they could not identify what it was. Fourth, descriptions of these objects from observers where circumstances virtually preclude collusion check quite well among themselves and against data received from other sources. It is not reasonable to assume that hundreds of ordinary normal people whose word we would readily accept under more mundane circumstances, for instances, as witnesses to an automobile accident, should suddenly become liars, fools, neurotics, and otherwise quite incompetent observers. I have interviewed many of these people myself, and I am convinced that they are sane, sober, honest folk who are reporting as best they can something which they really did witness. I will concede that maybe some of these people did not do as good a job of observing as someone who is better trained might have done, but within their limits, I believe they did honestly report what they saw. Let us look at a few more facts. First, there have been several close brushes with these objects, and in one case at least, the aircraft pilot lost his life as a consequence. Captain Mantell was reported killed as a result of chasing a flying saucer on January 7, 1947. The incident is described in detail in the report on unidentified flying objects by Edward J. Ruppelt, pages 51 to 60. Second, people who have been near these objects have described physical sensations which are unusual to say the least, but which are quite consistent with what is known of the technology under which they operate. As nearly as we are able to recreate the accident, Mantell was pursuing an unidentified flying object and was able to get quite near, in fact apparently well into its operating field. His aircraft just fell apart and was scattered over quite an area. Mantell's body, when recovered, was not displayed even to his next of kin. Several people who have found themselves close to these objects have remarked on the insufferable heat which seemed to pervade the general region. Also, there seemed to be a gravitational necessity to lean away from the object to maintain balance. While these facts may seem to be rather incredible, nevertheless, there exists quite a good record in support of each occurrence. Furthermore, the technology of which we have been able to get a glimpse namely that of manipulation of the three basic fields, electric, magnetic, and tempic, indicates quite a straightforward answer and explanation of these phenomena. In Mantell's case, the altered field configuration in the vicinity of the craft reduced the binding forces within the structure of the aircraft to a value below that of the load which the parts were expected to carry, so it just came apart. Also, there was probably a substantial reduction in tempic field intensity, 
which would give, in effect, a rise in temperature to the aircraft and contents. I understand that Mantell's body gave every indication of having been subjected to considerable heat. This rise in temperature has been reported as being quite noticeable at distances of several hundred feet from one of these craft when it is making use of certain combinations of fields. Also, since gravity involves a tempic field function, it follows that an alteration in this field could well be reflected in the direction and magnitude of the nearby gravity field. There have been quite a number of alleged communications with intelligences claiming to be extraterrestrial. I have followed up each such instance to the best of my ability in an effort to A, establish or disprove the validity of the alleged communication, and B, to obtain any information which might be available if the contact should be authentic. As might be expected, many of these alleged contacts provided little or nothing of value, but a few did pay off. Some of the contacts have been the subject of published material, but by far the majority are confidential, and there are a surprising number of these contacts. The procedure in checking contacts was to ask a number of innocuous but significant questions and compare the answers with the answers to the same questions as obtained through other contacts. Questions were of the type, do people live on the planet Mars? If so, what is the shape of their houses? Do people on Mars use money? If so, what does it look like? Altogether, some hundred or more questions were involved. The results were spectacular, to say the least. Among the contacts that might be classed as authentic, there was almost complete agreement. Among the other alleged contacts, there was extremely poor agreement, or none at all. Of course, where agreement was general, but one or two points didn't fit, an effort was made to find out why the discrepancy. In each case, it was found that someone had injected a terrestrial idea or comment instead of transmitting faithfully that which was received. Now, having located what seemed to be channels of communication between ourselves and these extraterrestrial intelligences, the next and obvious step was to try and get as much information as possible. As may be expected, this effort was at first directed towards science and technology. But it soon became apparent that there was a very real and quite large gap between this alien science and the science in which I had been trained. Certain crucial experiments were suggested and carried out, and in each case the results confirmed the validity of the alien science. Beyond this, the alien science was just incomprehensible. There followed a period of soul-searching, during which many doubts were raised. While we were able to establish that these people from outside all told the same story, was that story the truth? True, there existed some pretty good evidence to support their statements, but maybe there was some other more conventional explanation. If the whole thing were a delusion, then quite a large number of people were suffering from precisely the same delusion. And furthermore, delusions are not externalized. At least I had never heard of such a case. If on the other hand it were a hoax, it was by far the most gigantic hoax the world had ever known. And to what end and by whom was it perpetrated? The inevitable conclusion was that it was all real enough, but that the alien science was definitely alien, and possibly even forever beyond our comprehension. So another approach was tried, the philosophical, and here the answer was found in all its grandeur. I will not go into detail on the many revisions in ideas and basic thinking 
The are stating that the people from outside displayed great patience and understanding in overcoming the prejudices and misinformation I had spent many years in accumulating. I began for the first time in my life to realize the basic oneness of the universe and all that is in it. Science, philosophy, religion, substance, and energy are all facets of the same jewel. And before any one facet can be appreciated, the form of the jewel itself must be perceived. One of the most important things I had to realize was that we are not alone. The human race in the form of man extends throughout the universe and is incredibly ancient. Also, its appearance in physical form is but one of its many manifestations along the path of progress. Our civilization here on Earth now is only one of many that have come and gone. This planet has been colonized many times by people from elsewhere and our present human race are blood brothers of these people. Is it any wonder that they are interested in us? To orthodox thinkers this may seem strange, but not nearly so strange as our orthodox ideas on evolution. The question might be asked, if these people are our brothers and are interested in our welfare, why do they remain so aloof? The answer is available. There is a basic law of the universe which grants each and every individual independence and freedom of choice so that he may experience and learn from his experiences. No one has the right to interfere in the affairs of others. In fact, our Ten Commandments are directives against interference. If we disregard this law, we must suffer the consequences. And a little thought will show that our present world state is directly attributable to violation of this principle. When we enter this life, we do so to participate in certain events, the sequence of which was established before our birth, and which if altered substantially would deprive us of experiences necessary to our development. We have built in protection against altering substantially these sequences in that we do not consciously know of them. But these people from outside have a much greater knowledge than we have and have means of perceiving the sequences which must not be changed. Therefore, while they have every desire in the world to help and stand by ready, able, and willing to do so, they are not permitted by cosmic law to interfere. The dividing line between help and interference is very delicate indeed and sometimes hard to perceive, but it is a demonstration of individual and collective progress how well we can be guided by it. I am told that one of our difficulties is that we do not recognize a sufficient number of dimensions and make use of them in our science. Furthermore, we do not recognize the true nature of dimensions or of their place in our universe. I am told that so far as we are concerned, there are twelve dimensions of deity, and these provide the entire structure of our universe. Our conventional concepts of dimensions are most inadequate and restrictive and so long as we persist in them, we can never transcend the world of mechanical processes which we have built. In science, we have an established procedure always to tie a new discovery or observation to that which we already know. Even though know to do so requires extensive patchwork and perturbation factors to be applied to our existing knowledge to make the new knowledge fit. We invariably assume that the new knowledge must somehow be closely related to the old, and we are most zealous in tying the two together. As a consequence, we bend and warp our units of knowledge so that we can fasten them together, whether or not they belong together, until we have fabricated quite a structure which is almost completely closed on itself. 
Consequently, when we do find knowledge that should but just won't set our structure, we have no alternative but to reject it. I am informed that science really is much more simple than we imagine. And all the component parts fit together perfectly without any corrections. Possibly we should start over again and reassemble our knowledge in a different pattern. And this time fit the jigsaw puzzle together properly without trimming the pieces. I feel sure that if we were to do this and accept the philosophy upon which this new approach must of necessity be based, we can enjoy the technology and the way of life which is demonstrated to us by the presence of the spacecraft and of our brothers from elsewhere. Thank you. So Wilbur Smith, he didn't have a video of these craft flying around. You've seen the video of those craft flying around. They don't care what we're doing. They can do, they can do what they want. They can go across the galaxy. They don't care about what, all these, you know, political struggles down here. There's no interest to them. They're having a great time out in space flying around. That's the truth. I think. Do you, feel they have, do you feel they have no interest in us little creatures? They do. Some of them do, but some of them, you know, they, they, they can just go when they need to. As long as they don't get caught and shot down by the bad guys here, which yeah. they have. Yeah. The bad guys here have shot them down. Well, we see in one of those clips that... That's right. Energy that was an attempt. Energy bolt coming yeah. up. Yeah. And this is what Wilbur Smith said. I made no attempt to prove anything. I have no intention of doing so. It is up to each and every one to search out the truth and decide for themselves what is truth. Truth needs no justification that stands alone, which of course is the conclusion you come to when you're dealing with this stuff on you. Because you know you can't argue with some people. However much evidence you give them, it's just, oh, well, I'm not listening. You know, so that was, Smith came to the same conclusion pretty quickly as well. So basically for the Smith material, that's come from Grant Cameron, He's archived it in, over the last 25 years. So, and the audio on that, that's been done by other people. So we've got him to thank for that. But that's basically, yeah, thanks for uh, listening to me. It's been longer than anticipated. <laughs>